Hello, leaders of the world. Welcome to Spread Love and Organizations, the podcast for purpose-driven healthcare leaders striving to make life better around the world by leading their teams with genuine care, servant leadership, and love. I'm Naji, your host for this podcast, joined today by Jason Dupuis, a thought leader, speaker, and organizational behavior enthusiast who believes in the power of human experience as a key driver of organizational performance and strategy. Over the last 20 years, Jason has served as the Chief Experience Officer for PM Pediatrics Care, as well as the Administrative Director for Admitting and Emergency Services at Boston Children's Hospital. Most recently, Jason joined Fidelum Health as a consultant and principal healthcare advisor to bring the human brand concepts of warmth and competence into the human experience in healthcare. As a core value advocate and fanatic, Jason has devoted his career to successfully demonstrating that being a human first and leading with personal and organizational core values can create efficient and profitable operations while sim simultaneously delivering an exceptional experience for patients, families, and care teams. In addition to his professional roles, Jason is an adjunct professor in the Hellenic College School of Leadership and Management, as well as recently joining Boston College as an adjunct professor sir, in their Master's in Healthcare Administration program. Jason, it's such an honor to have you with me today. It is an unbelievably uh, uh, a tremendous honor to spend some time with you today and, and talk about leadership. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Can you please first share with us your story, how you ended up in healthcare uh, and now teaching leadership, management, and being passionate about organizational behavior? I'd love to learn more about that. Yeah, no, of course. Um, you know, my path into healthcare was kind of an interesting one. So my uh, it all started because my dad was in the army. And uh, so growing up as a kid, I moved around quite a bit. And uh, when I was very young, um, my father actually uh, became a nurse in the army. And so as we moved around living on uh, military posts around the country, you know, they're very small communities and on in every one of those communities, they also have a hospital. And so, uh, you know, I was able to spend a lot of time at the hospital seeing my dad. And then my my mother will also report that I spent a lot of time in there hurt, injured and uh, because of the crazy things that I did as a kid. But, you know, so I spent a lot of time in the hospital and I always saw hospitals as just like a cool place where my dad worked. That was I was comfortable there. I was excited to go there because I got to see my dad, um, you know, during his working hours, if you will. And uh, as I got older, I would ride my bike to the hospital when I lived in Fort Knox, Kentucky, and I would go see my dad or we would have lunch. And, uh, you know, so it was just kind of like hospitals were always this very comfortable place for me. So when I got to college, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to work in healthcare, but I didn't want to be a nurse. Uh, I didn't want to deal with any of the kind of the blood and guts, if you will. Uh, and then uh, I found a program at the University of New Hampshire called Health Management. And I was like, you know what? Like, I think this is for me. And so my my drive to get into healthcare was just trying to bring this idea that I'm very comfortable as a human. I'm very comfortable in the healthcare setting, whether it's a hospital or a clinic. I grew up around it with my dad and just saw an opportunity to bring that comfort to other kids or other patients that were going to the hospital that don't have those feelings of, you know, they have fear and anxiety. And the, and I just didn't have those as a kid. I, I saw it as a fun place where my dad worked, you know? And so uh, I kind of followed in my dad's footsteps, I guess, but, um, but that was how I actually had really ended up in, uh, in healthcare was, was through kind of being around it as a kid and uh, finding it to just be this amazing and fascinating place. Thanks for sharing, Jason. And yeah. how, how did you end up being passionate about organizational behavior? Well, I don't, you know, maybe watching it, right? We watch enough organizational <laughs> behavior and uh, and we become, or at least for me, I just became fascinated. Um, you know, that for me, that really developed during my time at Boston Children's as I, as I was kind of climbing through the leadership uh, organizational ladder and just seeing how organizations, you know, made decisions and how all of the moving parts, like how dynamic um, the moving parts of, of every organization are. And I just became fascinated by it. And, and what I started learning and realizing, which ties into the human stuff, is like the organization is going to do what an organization is going to do. It's going to make its decisions, set its strategy, create priorities, make goals. But at the end of the day, it's the humans. The humans underneath it are the ones that you know, you have to understand, build relationships with and grow with. And so for me, it was this organ, not just understanding organizational behavior, but understanding really how the humans respond and react to the organizational behavior and how can we uh, lead through that instead of um, allowing it to kind of control how we do something uh, or how we execute, how can we kind of lead, you know, and understand the organization's behavior enough to understand how to lead 
in it, within it, the construct of the confines. So let, let's double click on this. I'm intrigued uh, by what you describe as power of human experience. Uh, can you share with me a little bit more? What do you mean by that? And how does it translate into organizational performance? Yeah, of course. So, you know, this was a journey for me. And I know a lot are on this journey too in, in healthcare, trying to understand human experience. But, you know, I, I can share a little bit about when I when I started really realizing this. Um, and I, if I can, I'll tell a very short but a quick story. Um, you know, shortly after the height of the pandemic, I, I was with PM Pediatric Care at the time as the chief experience officer. And right after the height of the pandemic, you know, we started seeing an increase in um, negative events, what we call threatening events happening within our, our sites, within our physical locations with patient families coming in. And we had this one particular event where um, we watched video and we saw um, uh, it was a grandmother and our front desk person getting in. They were in some sort of an exchange. We could not hear. We could only see. And the front desk person, this particular front desk person was somebody that I knew. I had met multiple times. I knew them pretty well. And I saw them kind of just lose it. Like they they broke down in that situation too. A very heated exchange. The staff person actually had to be restrained, you know, pulled back away from the desk. And it was in that moment that I realized, hey, listen, everyone is struggling right now, right? That's the human experience thing. It's like, this is not just an angry parent or an angry grandparent with their kid and, and frustrated or what, you know, that they have to go to the doctor. It's like our staff are frustrated too. And it was watching that video was really where I started realizing like, Hey, we've got to start shifting and start thinking about this in terms of not patient experience, not employee experience, but human experience. We need to focus on the fact that at the core, we're all just humans. Um, and we have certain uh, and similar behaviors and characteristics that drive our actions and reactions. But we have to stop separating and say employee and patient. It's like they're really going through the same thing. And the pandemic for me was a huge example of that. Like us all going through that. No one was immune or right. We, we all went through that together. It didn't really matter. We all felt it. We all saw it. Um, and so that was what kind of really got me going and saying like, hey, we need to start thinking about this differently. But I wanted to go beyond thinking. We need to start looking at data differently. We need to start providing support differently um, and be more human centric, or as I like to say, human first, that every decision we're making or as we're doing things, we make ourselves in the mind of a human before we start making strategic decisions or taking direction that we think is a human first. How would this feel? How will it be perceived? How can we execute on it? Understanding humans underneath it. Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing yeah. this. It's super powerful. And uh, obviously, you, you touch on something in healthcare. I was just reading a new um, uh, article uh, that that went out. It seems uh, it you know all the frontliners have been really struggling uh, with also you know wrong behaviors and yes. and, and being aggressed. Uh, but and I love how you're sharing it. Everyone is struggling, right? Like there are both sides. And I think as leaders within organizations, taking care of your people. And it's a great segue to my second question, which is people, uh, you say human first. I was going to say people first because I, I always say this. Uh, you, so I like how you're framing it. It's human first. Uh, so can you, you devoted your career practically to demonstrate that it should be human first. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit more about this? Uh, you shared the story about what brought you to this belief. So can you share a little bit more now how you're taking this and making it a real practice, I would say, for organizations? Totally. I, you know, I think the primary thing um, in as far as bringing it into practice was really recentering and refocusing within the sphere of core values. And, you know, so some of my reading, you know, that I that I do, I call it for fun. Uh, but uh, some of the reading I do for fun isn't necessarily fun. It's actually very challenging and I enjoy it. But um, there were two big books that I'll mention that kind of helped this and got me onto this uh, or reinforced rather my my core values as being like a true north. And like, that's what's driving everything. The first book was Sapiens which um, you know, is a book that most people, I think at this point, has at least heard of. Many are afraid to pick it up. Uh, myself, was, I was included in that. Uh, actually, a, a former colleague, a guy by the name of Pat Dillingham, who used to work with me in, in patient experience at PM, recommended it to me in an airport. And he was like, dude, you got to read this. It's going to be amazing. And it actually blew my mind. And what it was, you know, what I learned in Sapiens in the first part of it was, hey, we're still programmed like we were thousands of years ago. 
yes, we've changed and technology has changed, but inside who we are at the core is still the same. And so that to me was very you know reassuring about core values of what we look for in other people, how we develop trust. Uh, and then the second book, um, which is what actually and ultimately led me to Fidelum Health and, and working with them was a, a book called The Human Brand, um, which was a book written about why we love or don't love organizations, uh, why we interact as consumers with organizations or we don't. And in that, uh, the, the author, uh, author Chris Malone and uh, his uh, colleague Susan Fisk actually put forth warmth and competence that humans judge other humans on warmth and competence. And when I got underneath that and started reading and studying that, I saw underneath that when we think about something like warmth, what does that mean? It means kindness. Do I trust you? And I said, core value, core value, <laughs> right? These are core values, trust, kindness, respect. Um, and so it was really through kind of combining those together and saying like, at the simplest form, we are just humans. So are we overcomplicating this? by putting too much process, too much digital technology, too much right strategy, and are we forgetting kindness, empathy, compassion, respect, understanding? And, it, and so I kind of see it as a back to the basics. And that, and that was really how I got on this pathway was core values and reading books that were using science and um, studies to show that we're still acting the same way we've acted for the last thousands of years in spite of or despite the technology. Yeah, pretty wild yeah. when you think about it, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. certainly. And th this is what actually brought me to love as the name of this podcast. You know, it's warmth. It, yeah, I, I call it love by its word. Yeah. Uh, so how, how do you ensure this, your daily work or working now with organizations really reflects what, what you like this deep belief of core values, uh, this deep belief of human first, when actually there is a constant stress pressure on results on how we're going to get there uh, and i'm i'm asking you this question that i always receive right like i'm a big believer of this so i'd love to see how you frame it and how you make sure that it's in daily practice in your organizations yeah, I think the number one thing, and um, you know, I just had the fortune. I did a, a a lunch and learn yesterday with an organization, and it was on a, a similar topic. And what I was talking about with them is that how it really starts is making sure that we individually share our own core values, um, that we know what our core values are, and that we're willing to discuss them and share them, and most importantly, back them up by living them. And you know, my three core values are passion, dedication, and integrity. And I always say passion, I love what I do, dedication, be there, and integrity, do the right thing. And so I have tried to live my life. I have failed many times at all three of those, you know, of you know, we all make mistakes. Um, but it really, I think, starts at that individual level. So when we say human first, it's like, okay, so as a human, I describe myself as someone who is passionate, dedicated, and operates with integrity. Um, and I've spent a lot of time, or when you're working with organizations, and I always say, I try not to work with organizations, we try to work with the team because those are the humans. It's trying to understand what are their drivers? What are their values? What is it that they're saying to me where I can extract what their value is? Um, so for example, if I hear somebody saying, you know, Joe's always late making up something. It's like, okay, that person, whoever that was saying that values punctuality and punctuality generally relates to respect. They want to feel that their time is respected, right? This idea that we can we're very good actually as humans at making those connections. And so I think it all starts with what are what are our individual core values? Can we quickly create alignment around? Do we agree that respect is important? Do we agree? You know, it kind of, I guess it's ground rules, right? I mean, that's what we're saying is how do we set core value ground rules? And then of course, it's always my next layer to that is what are the organization's core values and are we living them, right? And uh, so what are your core values? How do you live them? You know, is this, do people know them? Are they, are they aware? And Again, I, I, every time I have a conversation like this, I always say the same thing. I don't think I'm saying anything novel. I think what I'm pointing out is like we have removed ourselves, though, from the action backing up the words. And as a result, we have a say do gap. You know, we we say our core values. We don't do them. We say them, though, because that feels good, but we need to do them more. And so as I work with organizations or I give talks or even a podcast, it's always that's my focus. Know what your core values are. Be sure that others know what your core values are and spend time learning theirs. And in that, you will always find alignment, always. Going there, uh, you talk about value. So I'm I'm interested, I, I know you're teaching also leadership. Uh, is there one or two core values or, yeah, it's very different from capabilities, but I'm intrigued if there are like one or two that you think 
the leadership of today, a leader in the 21st century, specifically in healthcare, should have? Yeah, you know, I'm going to be cliche in the first one, and I'm going to say empathy. And um, and I'm using empathy on purpose, and I know it's a bit of a buzzword now, right? Brene Brown brought us this idea of empathy and vulnerability and understanding. We all, and everybody knows it. Everybody puts out content on empathy. But, you know, when I really look at healthcare leadership, I see a tremendous lack of empathy um, for and specifically post-pandemic of the insanity that the care teams went through during the pandemic. And I think there's a huge opportunity to be more empathetic to the struggle, more empathetic and understanding to the burnout, um, and really focusing on writing that ship um, that has already sailed and is sinking. And I think that that, I see that, I read that, I hear that, and I feel that. And I think that that's, so that's one of the areas where I say, I think empathy has to be in there. Um, and the other, from a healthcare perspective, has always been, and I still believe in this, is defying the status quo of, you know, that simple acceptance of what the system is and our willingness out of fear of change to allow the system to persist is a huge leadership problem, you know, and it's a, um, you know, you keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result is considered insane, right? Like that, really, there's a quote somewhere in that, right? That's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And so I do think that, we, you know, the system from a value perspective is starved from, you know, people defying that status quo and not just simply accepting it for the way it's always been for the last hundred years, you know? And I think that's, so that's two areas in healthcare leadership where I think if, if leaders are paying attention to being empathetic to those in their charge, and they are helping the people in their charge also push the envelope of innovation and defying the status quo, that that success will come behind that. I'm going to give you a word now, and I'd love your reaction to it. The first one is leadership. Passion. I think, um, I think leadership for me is, you know, if you're not passionate about it, you're going to fail. I think it's not, you know, there's the difference between managing and leading. Um, you know, the difference between a manager and a leader. Uh, and I found that out early on that, like, if you really enjoy the people component of it, you have to be passionate about it. If you're going to be successful as a leader, if you're not passionate about it, everyone sees through you very quickly. And so every time I hear leadership or anything like it, I think I'm passionate about it and you have to be passionate <laughs> I mean, uh, because it's not easy. It is not an easy task. And if you, as soon as your passion goes, it's time to go. I, I really believe that. The second one is health equity. You know, I think for me, that what comes to mind is my human first statement, that if we, you know, if we really start paying attention to the fact that, you know, things aren't fair, um, and we start paying attention to the fact that we are all humans, that it helps us shift the paradigm a little bit, not to separate out groups, but to say, hey, can we rally around the one thing that we all have in common, and that is human. So let's be a human first and then start building systems that consider all humans as humans and not build systems here and there and everywhere that never takes into consideration humans in general. And so, um, yeah, no, that was that was actually equity, health equity or equity in general and healthcare has always brought me into my that human first brain of saying, if we can do that really well and treat each other just like humans, we can make a lot of headway. The third one is homeostasis. Homeostasis, you gotta love it. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the big teachings of my dad as a as a kid, uh, and then as a teenager, and then as an adult, and then as a grown man, to give him credit, was balance. And right, the the definition of homeostasis is essentially balance in a system. And you know, so anytime that I kind of feel that there is an imbalance in a system, I feel like it is our responsibility to not just try to fix it, but to understand it and try to fix it. And I think oftentimes homeostasis in healthcare doesn't get achieved because we just try to fix it and we don't always understand the problem. And I think we've been action oriented that way by organizational decree, by history, by organizational structure. And so I would say every time I hear homeostasis, the first thing that comes to my mind is balance. And if you wanna establish balance and you wanna improve, you have to understand the problem. That gives you the balance, that true understanding. Love it. What about spread love and organizations? You know, I have been very fortunate in my career, you know, between Boston Children's and PM Pediatric Care is that, you know, I've worked with extremely passionate people and I've worked with some not passionate people. 
right? Um, and this idea of being able to spread love to each other inside of an organization is really talking about building community, or as um, as you've all would say in Sapiens, you know, building your tribe. Um, and when you have love in your tribe, there's trust, there's belonging, uh, and there's progress. Uh, when you don't, you have war and separation and, you know, all the other kind of the negative components. And so when I hear love, you know, I think organizational love or love throughout an organization is really getting everybody on the same page and believing in each other, which then allows you to believe in the organization. I, I think very rarely do people just believe in an organization. They believe in the people within the organization and you can put love into that. That's that's so powerful. And I can't agree more with you. <laughs> <laughs> Any final word of wisdom, Jason, for uh, healthcare leaders around the world? Yeah, you know. I would say that uh, the one thing that I learned, I learned it during the pandemic, I learned it during my time in the emergency department at Boston Children's, was that the number one thing a healthcare leader can do is show up. And, um, you know, that goes into my core value of dedication, which translates to me to be there. Um, there's never really a reason as a leader that you can't show up. I think showing up is a choice that every leader makes and that the best leaders, the most amazing leaders that I worked with were never, ever afraid to show up, never, ever afraid to show up and listen and never ever afraid to show up and listen and care. And, um, you know, so for anyone that's in healthcare leadership or trying to grow a career in, in a career that brings you into healthcare leadership, I would, I would say those are the things I would take away is always show up. Um, it's, it's the easiest thing to do sometimes is to physically show up, uh, but it matters when you do and everyone notices. It does. Thank you so much, uh, Jason, for being with me today and for this incredible chat. Thank unbelievable, you. unbelievable pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all for listening to Spread Love, an organization's podcast. Subscribe and connect with us on spreadloveio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Most importantly, spread love in your organizations and spread the word around you to inspire others and amplify this movement our world so desperately needs.